You're listening to iCannabisRadio.com. Welcome to In the Lab with Jennifer and my co-host, Amar. Hello. <laughs> we are, it's only us two in the studio today, but we are, um, actually, I lied. Chris and Sam are in the studio as well. Hello. <laughs> um, anyway. So we're going to be interviewing Jeff Raber from California. He owns a lab called The Workshop, and that is the W-E-R-C shop. And uh, he has helped me immensely in my journey of testing, and it's so exciting. He just came out with a paper. Him and uh, one of his scientists, Sitsa, came out with a paper called Determination of Pesticide Residues in Cannabis Smoke, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk to him uh, about this amazing article because there's nothing, there's been nothing about it. And um, we want to make sure people are getting or have the right decisions before, um, you know, they use certain products and that kind of thing. Plus, pesticide testing is mandated um, in Connecticut, Massachusetts, Washington State, Maine. You can, well, Maine, Connecticut, and Massachusetts, I don't even think you can use cannabis or uh, pesticides. No. Or Illinois. And, um, and I know that a dispensary did get in trouble in Maine for um, – for them finding pesticides. So it's awesome that they uh, wrote this paper, and I'm very excited to talk to him about it. Uh, But first, let's catch up on some things. Um, I want to know your opinion out there. So when anyone uh, submits a test to CAN Labs, it is always confidential, okay, to whoever paid for the test. Now, of course, in other industries, it is not like that. It's out there for the public to see, which makes sense. Um, and once CAN Labs will be able to apply for a certification in October here, um, all of those results are going to become public record. So currently, I have plenty of dispensaries that email me or, or bring in products of other companies right? Mm -hmm. Tamar, I know Dixie has, and I know Mm -hmm. some of the other edible companies because these edible companies, you know, pay for testing, make sure their product says what it says on the label, all of that. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't. And I'm sorry, but you cannot tell what is in an edible unless you test it, period. Now, there has been plenty opportunity for myself to, to, share these results. Um, Not those, but when it's a second party that is testing somebody else's, that is public knowledge. And most of the time, those test results don't come in. And I can give you some examples. I tested uh, an edible that was supposed to be 300 milligrams. It was 16. I've tested um, 250 milligrams usually is 90 to 110, but now has dropped to 70. I've tested CBD syrup that has no CBD in it and barely any THC in it. So yeah, this bothers me and it's a problem. And so for the first time in three years, I sent out a test report of an edible maker that has clearly makes up um, nonsense that uh, my lab results aren't accurate. And I, I, you know, I, I won't mention his name, but I 
he just sent me a nasty email saying, how dare I slander him and blah, 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 blah. Well, how dare he sell products that he absolutely knows are not 250 milligrams and tries to sell it as that? Mm -hmm. Um, And if, if he's not trying to say 250 active milligrams, then don't even put 250 milligrams on the package, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Your edibles are so great. Don't even put milligrams on the package. But it seems like, because I've seen this a lot too with, um, you know, vape oils, not just edibles, but some vape oils are claimed to be a thousand milligrams. And it's, with that same size cartridge, it is very, very hard to fit that much in that amount of milliliter space. Is it even, yeah, is it even possible, I was wondering? Um, I wish I brought it with me. There's larger cartridges, you know. Oh, you yeah, mm-hmm. you're right. Okay, mm-hmm. right? But that standard size, I mean, yes, it might be possible, but the only way to know is to actually test it. Right, right, and and they're going to have to test it because, mm-hmm. again, <laughs> if you're not trying to fool the patient, then don't put the milligrams on the package. Just say strong cannabis or say whatever you want, but don't put a numerical number on your package. And I'm just tired of it. And I'm tired of, you know, I work with a lot with parents, with kids with, with disease, and I'm tired that they are paying for, for things, trying to treat their children that, that don't that don't have any of the active ingredient in it. That's like you going to buy a prescription for whatever it is, and there's nothing in it. It is strictly snake oil, and I and I'm done with it. And I and you know, I let it get to me, and I shouldn't. But um, the bottom line is, I represent the consumer. And I represent the dispensary owners, and I just represent the edible companies. But the bottom line is, we are all in business because of the consumer. We should be focused on the consumer. So I'm sorry you know who you are, but you cannot sue me for reporting test results. So enough with that. Anyway, so what's what's exciting happening uh, in your lab? <laughs> well, we do have some R and D projects going on. Um, we are also very very busy as usual. So I don't think I can say anything. Well, that's true. Right now, right? Well, we can talk about the uh, trip to DC. That okay. was very exciting. Yeah. So um, thirty people from across the country. 30 people from across the country um, <clears throat> went and lobbied in D.C. It was wow. absolutely exciting. We lobbied for the 280A tax problem. Um, for those of you don't, that don't know this, um, dispensaries and growers and edible companies, there is a lot of stuff that they cannot write off, especially dispensary owners. Um, they can't write off. A, a ton of stuff because they are, you know, selling a Schedule One drug, so they can't write it off, which is which is awful. I mean, mm-hmm. some of these dispensaries are paying up to ninety percent tax. It's incredibly crazy, and people think that everyone's making hand over fist money. <clears throat> then we also lobbied on the banking issue, since um, I don't know whoever. Um, doesn't know this, but in the industry, there are no banks. If they find out that you're in cannabis at all, your bank gets closed. And the last, Mm -hmm. I think the last main credit union here in Colorado just closed 100 accounts. So that means that people walk around with thousands and thousands of dollars, and they put themselves, their family and everyone else in risk. And it's just sad. So 30 of us from across the country went out and we met with all kinds of senators and congressmen and congresswomen. Women. We had a press conference. We had five mm-hmm. congressmen or four congressmen, one congresswoman stand up, talk about how ridiculous this is, talked about how they had family that helped, that cannabis helped them. Absolutely incredible. It was, I mean, like I got tears in my eyes. It was so great. That's wonderful. I'm so, so happy to hear that. Isn't it great? So we did that. And um, 
um, God, just meetings and meetings and prepping and learning and it's just fabulous, but it does make a difference. So for any, for people listening out there, if you're, if you want anything to change, you need to get familiar with who's representing you on the state and federal level and really talk to them. Um, so that, that was what I did last week. Uh, we know that, uh, a lot of, Rules and regs are coming out from, you know, the Connecticut, Massachusetts, um, Washington State's working on theirs, now Illinois, and then um, who just passed? uh, Las Vegas just passed something, I think. Because I knew they were medical, but I think they passed something else recently. I can't keep track of it all. Right. And then, um, was it Vermont? Vermont? I I think so. So anyway, so many states. Um, But so what we're going to do is we're going to talk to Jeff and his lab um, in California, kind of talk about the problems he's seen in California um, since he does more testing than Can Labs does simply because in California, they usually don't grow their own. Um, It's coming from someplace that they don't know where. So they are a little more interested in testing pesticides and microbials and stuff. But um, I'm sure he's going to shock us with what he's seen out there. So can we take a break early and get him on the phone? So we'll take a break and we'll be right back. Catapunch is a delicious and effective medical marijuana beverage proudly made right here in Colorado. Each bottle is freshly infused with 100% pure flower extract from the highest grade marijuana plants available today. Using proprietary extraction methods, every bottle of Catapunch is consistently and reliably infused with an exact milligram dosage that you can count on to relieve your symptoms each and every time. Catapunch is delicious. There's never any medicine-y taste. We use only 100% cannabis flowers. No trim or byproducts are ever used in Catapunch. It does not require refrigeration and comes in convenient, resealable, multi-dose bottles from 60 milligrams to 200 milligrams. We have drinks with dosage that works best for you. Catapunch is available in a variety of delicious flavors like black cherry, watermelon, pineapple mango, and blue raspberry. And we now have strain-specific beverages available just for you. Catapunch is delicious, convenient, consistent, and effective. Give it a try and experience the Catapunch difference. Call Canisher at 1-800-420-5757 for all your insurance needs. Canisher understands the risks you face each day and we are there to protect your business and your investment. Since 2010, Canisher has been serving the cannabis industry nationwide. Call Canisher at 1-800-420-5757 or visit us on the web at canisher.com to learn more about our insurance and risk management services. Proud member of the NCIA. Green Faith Ministry is for spiritual guidance, MMJ information, and networking combined with compassionate care on the way to enlightenment with all Green Faith sacraments. Green Faith provides charity assistance, including medical and food throughout the year. Contact them at greenfaithministry.com. All right, and we are back. We are going to call Jeffrey right now. Oh, here we go. That was fast. Hello. Hello, Jeff. It's Jennifer and Tamar from In the Lab with Jennifer. How you doing? Hey, Jeff. Good. Hi, Tamar. Hi, Jennifer. How are you guys? Doing well. We're great. Good. We're we're just, we just set up the call and talked about how uh, that you run a lab in California and. So what I'd like to do is kind of you talk about how you got into this and, and about the workshop and then kind of go into the paper. Okay. Sure. All right. Sounds good. Great. Yep. That'll be easy enough. Yep. And then um, how long do we have? Are you going to like, how long is your segment? Um, well, we have the rest until four o'clock. We'll just, um, we'll just have to go to break. That's all. Okay. And so I'll have to, I'll text you or I'll interrupt you and probably in, what do we have? 10 minutes right now? We have 15 minutes till the next break. Okay. All right. Okay. Yep. That's easy enough. Makes sense. And feel free to ask your questions, Jen. 
All right. <laughs> well, wh- why don't you start uh, wh- start about how you got into the the industry and and your background personally? Okay. Sure. That'll be easy. All right. We're live there, Jeffrey. Oh, you are. (laughs) (laughs) My bad. (laughs) No worries. Um, Sorry. Well, I, um, I've always had an interest in developing medication or figuring out how we could cease and ease, um, ailments, um, for the general population and ever, and I've actually got written proof of those desires since I was in fifth grade when, uh, they sent those things that we wrote down in fifth grade back to us when we were seniors <laughs> in high school. Awesome. So it was uh, right? some really good teachers, I think, inspired me the right way to go figure out how to use my scientific interest to develop medications. In college, I went for biochemistry and learned both biology and chemistry, and in there I got really interested in organic chemistry. Mm-hmm. So how to create and synthesize molecules and what's of interest to uh, being able to do that to create pharmaceutical products or you know, different raw materials for a variety of needs. So I went on to graduate school in uh, organic chemistry at the University of Southern California. And with that, um, you know, learned how to really make uh, a lot of different molecules, did a lot of drug discovery, generic drug processing, manufacturing, um, and was trained in in those skill sets. Um, And a number of years ago, at the end of 2008, my brother was working in a construction company and was asked, to build out a storefront dispensary in California. So um, he comes home (laughs) with this idea, and I'm like, wow, is that legal? Can you actually do that? And what does this all entail? Because that was something I had absolutely no idea about. I moved to California in 1997. It was right after Proposition 215 in 1996 had passed. And I was anything but politically motivated, activated, interested, or, you know, in any sort of realm interested in any of that. I was mostly focused on my studies and, you know, getting through uh, school and getting my education completed. Um, As I was helping my brother with his construction company and um, we learned more about it, that there are laws that exist in place for people to possess medical cannabis for medical needs in California. We learned about um, the marketplace and what was actually going on. And the timing was interesting because President Obama just got elected. And as we were learning more about what could be done, realizing something could be done, um, it was still very dangerous times to figure out what the federal position would be. But in the beginning of 2009, with with, uh, what's now known as the Ogden Memo, and when uh, President Obama came out and said, we believe that we're going to allow the states to operate under clear-cut state laws. If you want to go ahead and do that, you may do that, and we're not going to prosecute patients that are in possession. And what I saw there was kind of like a a slight cry for help, like, hey, entrepreneurs, come on out and help us out and see what we can do um, to try and get this done the best possible way, as the states are the laboratories for the federal government. So what operations might work, what regulations make sense, what do the people really want to see and do, it all really starts at little local levels and works its way up to state levels, which then, you know, evolves into a good federal policy. So with that kind of intention saying it's clear to do that, we put our heads together and we're thinking what might be the best way we could help the most amount of people, and we thought that would be by providing our chemical skill sets, backgrounds, like a pharmaceutical back end, to as many dispensaries as possible, as opposed to being one dispensary ourselves. So there was a great need. No one knows which strain they had. No one knew if it was clean, who was producing it, where it was coming from, um, and they couldn't help guide patients the right way kept going around to different dispensaries in California and, we're, you know, when you tell them I have uh, the medical condition, I have is an irritable bowel and some chronic pain, and you ask uh, what's going to be good for that, and they keep saying, here's the top shelf product I have. No idea what each name means, which each molecules are with which uh, strains that we have, and no way to guide the patients. We thought if we could quantify what was going on in the plant, help breeders create other strains and different varieties rather than one that's just high in THC, Um, educate and diversify the use of the plants, which I think um, consuming it via oral consumption for anti-inflammatory benefits, much like juicing is done. Um, That's why we selected the equipment that we did in the beginning as far as uh, the liquid chromatograph so that you could detect those things and how we could ensure that there are no dangers or toxins going along with the medication. 
Um, my research, when I looked at considering doing this, was much, I'd say, the same conclusion as Lester Grinspoon, the emeritus doctor of Harvard, who says, uh, you know, it's relatively safe. These compounds are exceptionally safe. If you look at the LB50 for THC, it's uh, extremely large. And when you look at the effective regimes and where these molecules can have uh, physiological impacts, it's exceptionally small. Mm -hmm. So you have a very large therapeutic to safety ratio, um, almost unlike any other molecules that we know. Therefore, the components within cannabis are safe, but what goes along with it might not be as safe. Right. Um, and that was what we'd hoped we could help impact those things across what are we providing, how clean is it that what we're providing, and how do we guide people to the right strain for them, because I think it is exceptionally cruel for an insomniac to go get a medicine that they're told is going to put them to sleep, but in fact turns around and makes them more awake mm -hmm. because someone didn't know the difference or they called it an indica, but that effect wasn't related directly to that with that individual or ones that may exacerbate pain or be really different than that. So um, that was the motivation for coming about as a laboratory was to really help people guide their medical efforts in a much better fashion while ensuring that we have a clean supply so no one else is going to get hurt inadvertently. Yes, Does that make sense? <clears throat> absolutely. And that's actually one of that's one of our biggest concerns, right? We spread the good word of cannabis and how you can't die from it. And then if people start dying from dirty cannabis, it's going to be really sad. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, um, and we have just published some work that uh, relates directly to that. One of the questions that we had uh, early on when we said we can offer a pesticide screen is how do you know there's pesticides that I'm going to inhale and how do you know that would still be harmful for me? Which I think is a very fair question. We, uh, we were assuming that you'd be able to consume them. Certainly if they're there and you're going to eat the flowers or to eat a concentrate, you would definitely be consuming it that way. But what about inhalation, which seems to be a predominant way that most people are consuming these products? So we set forth to understand and quantify if I place a certain amount of pesticides on a flower and I combust it like I would through a handheld glass pipe or a water pipe or some other uh, you know, inhalation device, would I in, in fact be able to inhale any of that pesticide? And what we were able to determine was you are able to inhale a large amount of the pesticide that was on there. In some cases, up to 70% of what was present was able to go through the very short path handheld pipe. Oh. Um, and it was quite alarming, I would say, to, to realize that at that extent, as you need to consider oral consumption will have your stomach acid take care of some things, absorptivities won't be complete, and your liver will metabolize that into different products. Inhalation is much like injecting products. It goes straight into your bloodstream in that fashion. So if an, a liver metabolite is less toxic, you don't have that option as quickly when you're inhaling it. Mm -hmm. Most often, pharmaceuticals that are orally taken or could be taken via inhalation, you'll see the quality stringency levels are about an order of magnitude or tenfold wow. more stringent for those things you're going to inhale. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, we've... Uh, with you in Washington, you saw the discussion. Many people were talking about, well, what levels do we set? How do we go about mm -hmm. describing regu regulations and what should actually be on the product? And I, I think I speak for many people when we say, well, just don't put anything on there. We won't have to worry if it's still there in the end. Right. Um, or put things that are safe to consume instead of some horrifying things. Now, if we, and I think you've heard like we have, I believe that can be done. Good, healthy plants already generate a lot of good molecules to make sure they're not attacked by pests. Mm -hmm. um, there are other ways that you can use some very natural, safe-to-consume products that can keep away a few of the pests that might come around indoors. Um, but general cleanliness, the right varieties, and handling those in the right conditions seems to be fairly successful at keeping away problems from taking down your crops, even if you are indoors. So that it can be done, I prefer that nothing was on there, but if we're going to understand what may be put on there, we need to understand the levels that, are, that we would accept, um, keeping in mind that a lot of them can transfer and we can also inhale it. So I think we now have a lot of the information about how do we design and understand what might be acceptable or not. Um, to explain the problem to everybody, 
the U.S. federal government, the federal EPA, has not established any sort of application limits for pesticides on cannabis crops. Because they have no application limits, no one can understand how much should be on the crop at the end to determine if it's mm-hmm. present it. when we do an analytical test or not, and, and how to calculate how much would be acceptable based on consumption rates that are, you know, I'd say average for the population and in which fashion they're going to be doing that. So because it's been stifled for so long, no one has any conclusive scientific backbone evidence on any of that. And um, we were told by the California EPA that this was the first understanding that they've seen in at least transfer rates, and they're very anxious to learn more about what we've been able to find in California and how we're doing that so they can make decisions based on science as opposed to just kind of randomly taking a guess, (laughs) which I think is a a much better approach (laughs) um, for what we're trying to do. Absolutely. This is, it's absolutely fascinating. I mean, so up to 70% can be absorbed into your lungs or that you're smoking into your lungs, right? Yep, correct. Mm-hmm. That's uh, what That's we were right. able to trap in our simulated lung and said that that would have went into someone's lungs. Whether they absorb all of it before they exhale, that, that kind of thing, you can't really test. They'd have Got to it. have someone mm-hmm. inhale a pesticide and exhale it. <laughs> we don't want right. to do that. No. But we can assume mo- most of it would be inhaled or you're at least subjected to that much. So it's, uh, it is quite alarming, I would say. And we looked at four different types of pesticides. Um, two are very common already in the market, paclobutrazole and bifenthrin. Paclobutrazole is a plant growth regulator, so that's like a hormonal endocrine type disruptor. They're outlawed in California, but they oh. quite often are present in the nutrient systems, and they're not on the label, so people don't even, they might not even be aware that they're using those. Really? Um, which okay. I think is, yeah, we've had a couple that it's been a big concern. They're like, but I... I didn't put anything on there. It's like, well, what nutrient system did you use? Bushmaster, Fosfolib, those things have been known to have that in the past. I don't know if they still do, but it is, uh, apparently, they're they're coming from somewhere. Um, I think there's a lot of thoughts of, I flushed it. But what does flushing really mean, and how do you know you flushed it all out of there if you haven't confirmed it with a lab test? Right. Um, No way to tell. You know, yeah, there's no way to know other than to actually test it, so... I don't know how they can understand that they flushed it long enough without knowing how much they put on, when they put on it, and when to stop putting it on, and knowing how much volume of water to move through before they could confirm it was going to be, you know, removed from there and safe to consume. But that would be the right way to do it. And we don't have really those types of studies. So California said because the federal EPA says it's not allowed, we as the state of California for now will say it's not allowed as well. And we realize we have to now create our own systems of understanding if we're going to do that the right way. Right. But I and think, yeah, like Washington did it a little different. They're like, we're just going to say, <laughs> I don't know, if you test, if you have it, you're going to have to test. And mm-hmm. I haven't heard anything about what levels of which things they may be, uh, you know, asking for there, or even in some other states. It looks like they're saying these were used and these were found at these levels or not. Um, but that still needs to be calculated and determined, determined based on how much you're consuming each day. Do you do you think that people are having a harder time in using these because of the scale of these operations now that are so big? <clears throat> um, it's possible. The bigger you, the bigger your operation, the more difficult it would be to manage, and the more challenging it would be to keep it clean. But I would think that you you should be able to scale it out as big as you would want. It just might be a little bit more costly or difficult to do it at a larger scale than than in a smaller environment. But it should, the same principles should all apply. But I would definitely agree with growing pains in that fashion of expansion. It's probably going to be, because it, it's, you know, like I know, this is like a race in some sense. People are running really fast. Right. And that lends to cutting corners and not properly, well, I really should spend money here on this air handling with the HEPA filter, but I'm just going to skip that part. Right. It's pretty expensive for now. I'll catch up later. Mm-hmm. And then later sometimes never comes. Yep. Um, which can be a big challenge. So, it yeah, can. I think it is, it is a concern. Well, yeah. and, you know, I mean, if these... Why take the chance anyway? I mean, if there's, I know that there, I mean, I have been told that there are ways to do this. And clearly a lot of states are thinking that way as well. So why can't we just say, um, 
you know, we, you can, you can use X, Y, Z, but, but again, with that said, Jeff, I know that you don't tell them which pesticides you test for because then they'll just use something else. And right. so so that's the thing. Yep. I mean, you can't tell them which ones they can use. But what, I guess yep. what you could do is either say you can't use any or you can't at least use these that we absolutely know are, are bad for you. So we've got to take a break, um, Jeff, and we'll come back and talk about that. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Thanks. Thank you. Tired of dispensary hopping? Trying to find quality meds? Look no further and get to know Greenworks. Our shops are stocked with over 20 strains of organically grown meds, including R4, the highest testing CBD strain in Colorado. Yes, we back up our quality with testing. While Greenworks offers only the highest quality meds, we don't believe in high prices, with eighths ranging from $20 to $40 and ounces capped at $175. With two centers in Denver and one in Glenwood Springs, we're likely closer than you think. Call 303-647-5210 to find the location nearest you. Blue Sage Microbes unveils the ultimate in superior soil. Ideal Soil, a 16-quart bag of the best growing soil ever engineered. Superior plant health and vitality is a direct result of the structure and chemistry of your soil. How good is your growing soil? Is your growing soil really balanced? How do you know? Well, Blue Sage Microbes has a newly designed growing soil that is the most advanced growing medium ever offered for cannabis cultivation. This is the only brand in the marketplace that provides growers with an ideal soil structure designed to work specifically with their cultivation systems. You will have your best grow results ever. Call now for a special introductory offer. 888-959-8. 551 or log on to bluesagemicrobes.com and experience a new level in growing. That's 888-959-8551. National Cannabis Industry Association would like to thank its members who represent the leading professional businesses in America's emerging legal cannabis market. NCIA is the only organization that has unified legitimate cannabis business across the nation to fight for real reform in Washington, D.C. For more information or to make your business a member, visit us online at thecannabisindustry.org. What's up? All right. So we are back. Jeff, you still there? I'm still here. All right. Perfect. So, um, yeah. So I guess the the tough thing is, you know, you can't really tell tell them which ones you're looking for because, of course, they're going to go and use something different. Could you have right, like a, a, a list of approved uh, ones? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, oh, Tamar. Sorry, Jeff. I was just asking if um, if you could have a list of approved, you know. Right, but you still have to test for those others because mm-hmm. they will. Right. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Sneaky, sneaky. So this is I guess, the best analogy we've been able to come with, come up with. It's a very big cat and mouse game. We don't publish what we look for because mm-hmm. then they'll say, well, make sure I don't use any of that, and I'll go try to find something else. Um, it does keep them a little bit off balance. And now, if we mm-hmm. find something, we do let them know exactly what we found because um, it's not fair to say you failed, but they don't know why. Right, right. <laughs> so right. we don't publish that, but we do discuss that with them. If they have any questions, um, we can go about validating that, demonstrating it, and really figuring out exactly why they, they might have those questions. Usually they don't have any questions. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> it's, uh, it's most often the response. Mm-hmm. Or, darn, I thought I got that out of there, and now I need to do better with what I'm doing. Um, but it is much like um, doping in the athletic world. Right. So as technology adds, or, or even the spice game, you know, as we add right. compounds to lists, mm-hmm that you're not allowed to have. The next ones are made that are not on that list and may not be detected. They could be detected, but you're not looking for it. So um, the difference in equipment, when you have to look for things that you know what you're looking for versus what you don't know what you're looking for, there's a huge trade-off in accuracy of what you're able to look for when you're trying to look very, very broadly. So we've tried to set up experiments with a lot of equipment vendors and the ones that cost (laughs) <laughs> more than a house, you know, half a million dollars worth of hardware that's the latest and greatest, super duper things that you can use, still couldn't quite tackle that problem in an acceptable fashion to us with, if I don't know what I'm looking for, how do I look for everything? And it really couldn't look for everything very, very well at the sensitivity limits you wanted to. Now, when you ask, I want to look exactly for this, 
he did that very well. Right. Um, and that was more of like, okay, if these are what are allowed and what's on the list, then I want to add those to what's being utilized um, and what's on my list. If I also know there's things that are not on the magic list but that they're using, I'm going to add those to look for those too. Now, eventually, labs can build up, um, you know, hundreds of compounds that they look for at once. It's not easy. Right. It's very, very, very challenging. Um, and it's, it's difficult to do that very well, but it is doable. And I think over time, you know, we'll have a larger and larger list and we'll be able to look for hundreds of different potential contaminants to make sure that we're doing the best job that we can. I think it's, it is really important for the public to understand that all the results are not the same. It really matters on what work is being done behind each of those results. If someone else says, this is free of pesticides, well, what did they look for? How did they look for it? And how good are they at looking for that? We know of other labs that are thankfully no longer in existence who for years just passed everybody's pesticide screen because wow. they couldn't look at any sort of sensitivity mm -hmm. or any sort of accuracy to find those things. They were happy to charge for it and happy to give that false sense of security that they actually, you know, were doing a decent job. But really, you, you need to look at the lab and look at who's performing the work with which equipment, what are they able to do. Um, and I know, Jennifer, like ourselves, you're very open and happy to explain what you're doing to people so that they understand and have the confidence in, in what you're doing. Um, but it is important to ask that and not just assume, oh, they ran a test, it must be good. Right. It doesn't work that way. Well, right. It's very and challenging. Same yeah. goes, you know, for um, people claiming quantitative when they're using qualitative um, methods. Uh, Correct. You know, same thing. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. this has been a slow education <laughs> road, but we're getting there. I can... I can give you great hope. Last night we were um, at a contest that we had run samples for. It was called the Beyond Boro Contest. And there were extract artists there that were, you know, submitting some of their best samples. Uh, it was a smaller event, but they really raised the bar in terms of they're looking for quality. You know, who had residual solvents or not, nice. which ones were pesticide-free, and they actually gave out awards for those things. Wow, and that's I was awesome. super, super excited and encouraged. It was the first time as a lab we were thanked for doing the job that we were doing, I mean, mm -hmm. really, by some of the contestants. They're usually pretty angry they didn't get a good <laughs> right. number. <or> <laughs> right, right. What are, um, <laughs> Jeff, if you don't mind me asking, what are some of the, uh, the cleanest uh, numbers that you, s you saw? So we, we actually had... I believe it was three. It was three samples that had no solvent, residual solvent. They were undetectable, and we know that we can detect down to at least one part per million. Wow! So and that's how many samples total? Low. How many yeah. samples total oh. did you get? We had ten, and three were clean. Yeah. Yep, and there were four contaminated with pesticides, and amazingly, three of those that had no solvents also were ones with no pesticides. Wow. So they, and, they really, and, and we learned later, two of those three were really good friends doing the same things. So they had so a very sense. good conscientious grow, pesticide-free, and they were very good about what they did when they handled their product mm -hmm. and processed it. Uh, and both doing the same things, they were able to remove all the residual solvents. So it was it was quite informative, quite interesting, uh, definitely. And, and it was really unique that they actually kind of raised up quality and, and transparency. Um, and I mm -hmm. think everybody appreciated that. It was a pretty interesting feel. It's the first time we've seen that. And I was very excited and encouraged by that. That's great. And and for the dirty samples, were they were they inquiring to you about uh, what do we do wrong or, you know, blah, blah, blah? Yeah, we, yeah, a lot was learned in that sense. I mean, some were like, wait a minute, my grower told me he didn't have anything. <laughs> Can you send me these results because I need to go have a conversation? <laughs> and we're like, yeah. Here's how to have that conversation. Don't go, you know, arm swinging because <laughs> you need to have the conversation because he might not have known that this plant growth regulator was there. It's quite possible. Or he might have assumed this and this. So mm -hmm. um, I think it was very informative and educational all the way around. And others were then wondering, of course, they asked the winners, what did you do? How can I get to that level? Um, you know, if I need to be solvent free or other people who didn't enter were like, well, I want to come and, and make sure I can get that seal of approval and figure out how I can do it too. I think they realized that now that it can be done and that it will be looked at to being done, they need to figure out how to right. do that. And it's, 
they all love to compete. I think they all like to be the best, and they want to go out there and push the limits on what they can do. Um, this is just giving them more of an ability to do it at greater detail, and I think they were very all well receptive of that. And it was exceptionally encouraging to see, I think, because all the patients in the end are going to benefit tremendously from that. Absolutely. As you were mentioning, you know, this is an extremely safe medicine, so we want to keep it unadulterated and keep it safe um, and pure. So, I mean, I think that's great. I'm, I'm excited to do that here in Colorado. Me too. <laughs> um, and I, yeah. I have a feeling that uh, there's going to be a lot of upset people. Let's talk about when we were at the um, Seattle Testing Summit about um, let's give the listeners mm-hmm. some idea of how many people pe- fail microbials and pesticide tests. What does that look like in California? So we see on average approximately 25% of the samples we screen fail at one part of our microbiological test or another. We test uh, for three different classes of bacteria. Uh, the ones that live in oxygen, total aerobic counts, mm-hmm. or that breathe oxygen to live. The um, enterobacteria with coliforms, and those are gram-negative bile-resistant bacteria. Typically, the really nasty players are in that one, like the E. coli, Salmonella, Pseudomonas, they're all in that class of bacteria. And then a combined yeast and molds. So anything that is in that class that could grow, which would include aspergillus or other types of molds as well. Um, and out of those three, we run them at the levels that were talked about in Washington. Um, we call that our gold level. That's the uh, U.S. Pharmacopeia grade nutritional botanicals standard, you know, for plants, basically. Um, and we see 25% of those things fail, one of those or another. Some of them fail exceptionally early, which means that they really have no chance and fail uh, in passing much uh, other levels, even lower levels. Uh-huh. Um, and some of them fail every class. Some of them fail just one. Most often it is molds, um, but we do find enterobacteria uh, as well, which I think is part of the bigger concerns. Uh-huh. I don't know if you can actually consume those through inhalation, but there are published reports of aspergillosis inside of people's lungs, which they believe did come from contaminated cannabis. So um, knowing that if you're inhaling, like think about if you're inhaling a pre-rolled cigarette a joint, you know, the very end of it is burning, but the rest of it, you're kind of pulling air past, but that's not as hot. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm kind of sucking on a, like a rod of the flower, right. and I could inhale spores that are not being subjected to high heat or burned off before I get them. So knowing that, knowing that you probably could transfer some of those, you're certainly going to be able to rub your hands all over it and put it in your eye or on your mouth. Um, you don't want those things being on the product. So they, they are definitely cause for concern. Yeah, and then and pesticides, we see about 10% of our products are failing that one way or another. 10% though, that's... that's uh... I, Less than we, 25. We know we're yeah. not able to look at everything. Right, so I think that's it's actually true, right. worse than what we're able to yeah. cover, um, sure. unfortunately. Well, and, and we don't get that many people submitting their samples for those types of tests. Right. <laughs> I think that's the uh, of other course. thing that concerns <laughs> Well, yeah. and I know that um, when Full Spectrum uh, was testing here, they um, Heather, who now works with us, had a spreadsheet um, or not a spreadsheet, a uh, graph basically showing all the contaminated. And at that point, can you imagine how many people were testing early 2010? Uh, not yeah. many. And like yeah. all of them, I mean, they were finding yeah. Salmonella, E. coli. But the joint is really scary because, listen, when you go in to buy a joint, that's the bottom of the barrel. That's the, you know what I mean? Like, that's scaring sure, the crap out of me. The joints that they saw give other away. people lick them closed already. I yeah. Oh, yeah. I didn't they even think about them. that. They, they get a good amount of well, I, re- <laughs> I remember that was one of my very early experiences. They're like, would you like a free pre-roll with that? And as they licked it, I'm like, no. I'll <laughs> right. take a free gram, Jeff. but I don't want you to finger it up and lick it for me. <laughs> no. no Us as biologists, we don't want any extra DNA. Thank you. Yeah. No thanks. <laughs> no thanks. Yep. I'll pass. Um, I will never buy another um, pre-roll in my life. <laughs> yeah. 
I don't think many patients consider all those things. We have a unique perspective because of what we see in the lab. And others have asked, do you eat your food the same? Like, yeah, I still do, but I, I still question some things maybe a little bit more. Um, but yeah, I'm, still, I'm worried a little bit more, but I still eat and consume things, that, you know, at the same rate. Um, for but sure. It is a, an enlightening when you see the lab data, for sure. Right, definitely. Well, before you got on, I, um, I was talking about um, mislabeling. And I have to take a break right now, Jeff. We'll be right back, okay? Mm-hmm. Okay. In Dispensary in Colorado Springs is proud to support Overgrow the Radio. With two locations in Colorado Springs, In Dispensary invites you to discover what true selection and values feel like. Always featuring an incredible array of Stanley Brothers medicine as well as full line of edible and infused products. In Dispensary is open from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. seven days a week, 364 days a year. You owe it to your health and well-being to discover In Dispensary. West Side location at 3044 West Colorado and East Side location at 3031 East Platte in Colorado Springs. Indispensary is your destination for indispensable quality medicine. This segment was brought to you by The Farm, a medical marijuana care center located at 2801 Iris Street in Boulder. The Farm carries premium cannabis, edibles, and hummingbird brand products. Visit our new cannabis lifestyle store for your local artesian glass, vaporizers, and hemp clothing. The Farm has been serving Boulder since 2009. Isn't it time you come and see what we have to offer? I'm Gary Johnson, and you're listening to iCannabis Radio, and I want to say, talk it up, Colorado. All right, Jeff, you still there? Yep, I'm still there. <laughs> okay. So what we were talking about before you got on is I got a nasty email from an edible uh, company saying that if um, if I slander their company, they're going to sue me. Um So, yeah, so all I did was send out an email to a few of my clients letting them know that now their test results dropped even more and it doesn't match the label. And so now he's wanting to sue me for all of this stuff. And what how many how many labels match out there in California for edibles? Um, we have a, so we learned the same probably difficult lesson you're going through in the beginning too. You would like to approach everybody and believe and hope and think that they are honest, ethical, actually going to do what they say they're going to do responsible individuals that realize the people are utilizing this information for medical purposes, for safety purposes, and are trying to better themselves. Um, through the use of this, not simply can I really get wasted out of my mind uh, to the point where I almost vomit from taking this guy's edible. Um, but we we came into people that used our labels once and proceeded to continue to use that for well over a year, yep. which you know is like many, many, many batches later. Each time they make it, if it's not being watched or being able to be done the right way and you can't calculate, you have no idea what's going in there. Right. This one, we actually did get another sample a year later from the same guy, um, and there was next to nothing in that edible product. And oh. he said, look at your problem. <laughs> he said, well, I can't believe that. I just bought brand new trim. It's the best trim I've ever bought. It was the most expensive. I said, I, I'll test it for free because I'll show you garbage in equals garbage oh, no. out. You don't have anything in there. Right. And sure enough, the trim was less than 1%. Yeah. Oh, my <laughs> so God, and that's I terrible said, trim. Yeah, that like, how much did you just use that trim for? If you'd have paid $50 for our test, you would have saved yourself thousands upon thousands oh. of dollars of uh, mistakes, headaches, accidents, and now brand reputation, really. Right. Um, it, it's so short-sighted and meaningless to not go and confirm and check your products to know how much butter or oil or active ingredients you're trying to put in there. I just don't get it. So there have been cases where they don't like comply with like continuing to do it and the label is inaccurate. We put this has been tested on at this date and we have seen people try to edit our certificates of analysis, but not our labels just yet. Thankfully. Um, you know, it's really concerning that with today's digital technologies, you can pretty much duplicate anything. Um, but we have ways of tracking that down and we've actually been able to stop that too. And, now we work closely with edible providers that they have to confirm and build up from the concentrate to the butter or oil and into the final product before we are to give them a label. 
and most are saying they just test their butter with us and confirm it, and the patients know that that's true because they're getting the same dose every single time. Mm -hmm. And because a few have started to do that, we're now seeing many others coming in and saying, I have to do that too because that guy is getting everybody to buy his stuff Mm -hmm. and none of them are buying my stuff. So um, they've kind of raised the quality of the game. But they do... We only have very, very few edible providers that are actually using um, our service on a consistent basis. Right. Flower guys, they do use the labels a little bit too often as well. Right. Um, so as a patient, you have to ask, you know, when was this test done? We try to put that information on the labels we provide, but people don't always provide the labels. So look at the dates of the test and then use your best judgment on how often are people going into that place, how fast do you think the product volumes turn over, um, and realize, at least in California, many people aren't buying 10, 20 pounds of the same material at a time. They have very small volumes, and they have a lot of those different types, and move through them pretty quickly so they don't degrade in the shelf. Um, so there is turnover that, you know, if you've seen a label for years, that's not going to be right. Um, right, right or right the batch question. number. We've had people use the same batch number for years, too. Um, well, that's... Yep. So, so do you have... Um, your the good edible companies that are doing this um, are their competition or do, are they bringing in their competition's products just to get it tested so they can show their clients that you know here some it is. have done that yeah mm-hmm. I mean we yep some they're able to do that we'll run whatever test they pay for right that's whatever right when they ask we'll give them the info it's a great way to scout the market mm-hmm. I think the way to do that if you're looking to do that against your competitors would be to do it. Uh, multiple batches. Make sure you go to multiple places and buy the same mm-hmm. things, different mm-hmm. things, different times, different periods, and show over three times that I did this guy's stuff. It's all over the place. Mine's the same every time. That is ex- I think then, yeah. Yeah, That's what, exactly idea. what I did. So a good idea. he claims 250, and I've tested his product at least 15 times mm-hmm. over the last year and a half probably, and they all were 90 to 110. And then wow. we just did it, and it was 70 now. Do you and, see any uh, cannabinoid acids still in there? Um, I have to – I ha- th- this just came up because he sent me a, a nasty email, but um, I'll have to go back and look <laughs> at the test results. Um, yep. Some of it is – Because sometimes uh, yeah. it's, it's to know – I mean, uh, I don't understand every time, but sometimes it is to no fault of their own. They are getting bad information from another lab operator or for someone else that actually did tests in an improper fashion sure. for what needs to be done with an edible. Sure. Um, and it can be very difficult – to convince them that it's otherwise once they've gotten on the other train. Um, well, he, he doesn't test, We've tried to prove though. it to others. Like, here's 10, 10 samples. You told me that was your value, and here's a whole set of 10, and I can show you why. I can explain why you see these values, this stuff. If I do the math, it would add up to that, and they still wouldn't believe it. <laughs> right. Like, well, and <laughs> right. he, he, uh, he doesn't test, and he no one else in Colorado can test edibles. So... Um, but he doesn't test, and he claims that the few times he tested with me a long time ago that my, they were off, but he never tested his end product with me. So it's just frustrating, and I know you feel the same out there, yeah. and and, and uh, I just kind of was wondering because, listen, when, when Colorado, when you can apply for a laboratory license, those are all going to be posted anyway. Mm-hmm. So if somebody fails a test, oh, yeah. it's probably going to go up on the CDPHE or the – Medical Marijuana Enforcement Division. So, you know, don't, don't well, get they out of may, me. They may be able to strip your license if you're not accurately hitting label claims. That's I mean, right. They may be able to fine you ridiculously. Right. Um, and there are, you know, a lot of federal precedents for that. There are other state precedents for that. You know, misappropriation of label claims is a huge penalty. Mm -hmm. You can't misinform the public, and certainly here with the amount of an active ingredient of that type, you definitely can't do it there. Um, And I know that different states are really wrestling with how tight do we want our label specifications to be in this instance. Um, And Colorado, I believe, will have some fairly tight ones when they're all said and done. So if they aren't testing or they're trying to skip lot test and not do every one, mm-hmm. it's it's going to really haunt them and cost them far more than running a test. I mean, think if you're looking long term, cost of doing business, what makes the most sense to protect public health and safety? Testing's a no brainer. 
it's really similar to the short-sighted mindset that's trying to grab every penny they can and not care about who they're con- impacting with their products that's choosing not to test right now. Right. And I think um, we see too much of that, unfortunately. But that I'm optimistic that mindset and mentality is changing. The states are going to force them to change sooner than later. Mm-hmm. But if, you can't, if they don't have confidence in testing the final product, they could at least try to test the concentrate or the <laughs> right. immediate one. That's easy mm-hmm. to test. You can do that. Right. And then you can calculate with them how much should be in there and then test the final product and show them, see, it is all there. <laughs> yeah. Um, exactly. And that's the way to do it with the, the math that goes along. And it's not, I mean, batches of edible products, even if they're selling, you know, like 12 brownies, <laughs> it's probably cost-effective to still test for some of that. Like, yeah. they just have to have a large enough batch to make sense. And when you have gallons of oil that's been infused the right way to know how to make each of your batches, it's super cost-effective. You're talking pennies on a the brownie then. So right. if I'm a consumer and I haven't seen a product accurately tested, you really have to wonder why and not settle for that. Go for the few that are, and eventually everyone else will do it. Um, exactly. Think, you, know, you owe it to yourself to buy the right quality and to know who's giving you what. Well, and you get what you pay for, too. Like, you know, some dispensaries yep. don't want to buy certain edibles because they're too expensive. Well, yeah, those are probably the edibles that test. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that are are yeah. the 100 and 200 milligrams, not the ones that don't test that would have absolutely no idea of what's in their product. So, you know, the, people are getting savvy yeah. here and dispensary owners do not like patients to come back and say, I wasn't happy with this product. So they're st- they're starting to, to not carry those products. And, you know, for him oh, to, well. yeah, yeah, I mean, for him to lash out at me, um, he should be thinking about, why he doesn't want to test to provide accurate measurements to his, you know, his patients. I mean, if it doesn't matter, if it says 250 and it doesn't matter, well, then don't put it on the label. Just leave it off. Yeah, if you don't, yeah, if you don't know, then put a blank on there. Right. Or, or if it doesn't <laughs> yeah. matter and it's weight, well, no one cares about weight. They just care about active milligrams. So d- don't put it on your label then. <laughs> We've yeah we've seen that. This uses one gram of cannabis to right. make cookie. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? Right. One gram of which cannabis? How much? What was right. activated out of that? I mean, I can eat many grams of raw cannabis and feel no psychoactive <laughs> effects. Right. Because the plant doesn't make THC. Right. So how much of which milligrams are actually in here? So I know what I'm actually getting. And uh, yeah, we can do it, and it can be done. So the fact that they argue it can't be is incorrect, and the fact that they don't want to says a lot about that. Absolutely. It does. And, you know, it's 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 not going to be very much longer that, thank God, Colorado. And then I, you know, it's great that all the states coming on board are, are mandating testing. Um, so it'll be, thank God, much easier mm-hmm. for those labs um, and to educate, you know, the I mean, consumer. you have to. You look at nutraceuticals, dietary supplements, right. pharmaceuticals. Testing yep. is the cornerstone. You know, for quality control, for dose verification, it's just insane to think that we can't move, we, that we shouldn't move in that direction. We right. have to. Right. Yeah. Right. It's just another plant. We, we know how to test plants. Right? It's not, you know, magic witchcraft to figure <laughs> out how to actually do this well. It, it's pretty well established, I'd say. Well, and the consumer deserves it. I don't think that they should. I mean, there was a question of I can never get it. Now that it's available, can I get the right stuff the right way and know exactly what I'm getting? We, we have to demand that as consumers, mm-hmm. I would say. Absolutely. And yeah. I think, you know, just yeah. educating patients. Like this uh, pesticide article is fantastic, and I'm going mm-hmm. – I've, I've shared it uh, to people, and, I, uh, you know, just want to spread the word because that's the first that's been done for – for inhaling because you know like you said all we've talked about is ingesting and then you have some of your stomach acids so you know it really makes a huge difference there there. yeah so in in cigarettes they assume you're still going to die from the cigarette (laughs) they didn't care how much pesticide was on there but this is a very different case so it is a very different case especially when people are sick and taking this for yep. medicine. So, all yeah, right. Well, we have we have less than a minute. Um, what what else would you like to say before we're 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 done? And I'll definitely have you on again to talk about some other things because I know we barely got to talk. Oh. 
No worries. I would just like to say thanks for the opportunity, and uh, if to all the individuals out there demand that your provider is testing their products because you deserve it, it's your right to have it that way, and uh, you should know what you're consuming. Once you know, then you know exactly what you need, how much you need, and, and you can always assure yourself that you'll get the desired results that way. So it's in your best interest, the best of the community, and it really supports the cannabis movement the best way to demonstrate mm-hmm. responsibility and acceptance in our society that it's actually just another product. And where can people um, right now in California get a hold of the workshop? So they can just, uh, there's a contact form on our website, okay. uh, theworkshop.com, T H E W E R C S H O P.com. And uh, fill out the contact form. They'll send us an email, and we'll get back in touch with them. Well, fantastic. And like I said, uh, Jeffrey has been an awesome ally uh, for Cam Labs because the, the, the labs are pretty tight-lipped, and I wish I would have had you around three years ago when I started out because <laughs> I was struggled. But um, <laughs> together we can uh, you know, make sure that patients and uh, you know, users get safe and effective medicine. Absolutely. Yep. Well, keep thank work, Keep up the good work there, Jen. You too, Jeffrey. Yep. Thank you so much. And Thanks, um, we'll have to have you on in the future. Anytime. You're welcome. All right. Take thank care. You. Bye, Jeff. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. Take care tomorrow. Thank you. Bye. Bye. You're welcome. All right. <laughs> All right, and that's the end of our show. Next week, you'll be with Tamar as I will be on vacation in Boston and Maine. Stay tuned for Georgia at 7 o'clock. Stay tuned for Georgia at 7 o'clock.